Hello, everyone. This is number 15 in my ongoing series on YouTube dealing with interpretations of Bible prophecy through the ages. And in the previous two episodes, numbers 13 and 14, I introduced this concept of what I'm calling floating prophecies. And what I mean by that is a chapter or usually more than one chapter clustered together, embedded in one of the Hebrew prophets of the Hebrew Bible or what Christians call the Old Testament. But these sections don't seem to really be tied to any specific date or time. They're very difficult to date and pin down. They don't really make allusions to historical events that we can identify with any degree of certainty. So they're sort of floating within the text of the Hebrew Bible itself, but also in terms of how they're then picked up and pulled out and applied and reapplied down through history. So previously, I've already dealt with the book of Joel, particularly chapter 3. And last time I talked about Zechariah 9 through 14, which is actually three separate texts put together. And today I want to deal with what scholars call the Isaiah apocalypse. And when you think of an apocalypse, we have lots of them in ancient literature. The best known, of course, is the book of Revelation in the New Testament. Its name in Greek is the Apocalypse, and it claims to be the Apocalypse of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must shortly come to pass. You can read the opening of the book of Revelation. And there are lots of others that are not in the canonical Hebrew Bible or Old Testament or New Testament that we know of from Jewish and Christian literature. Now, before I get into the Isaiah apocalypse, uh, let me share my screen. And I want to show you something. If you do a search on whatever search engine you like, I've chosen Google here. And you put in Israel, war, Hamas, Bible prophecy, you get literally millions of responses. I think when I did it a couple of days ago, it was six million. Now it's up to uh, seven and a half million in a little less than a second. But here's the one that caught my eye today. And it really does relate uh, in a way to what I'm going to say. Netanyahu. Uh, the Prime Minister of Israel recently gave a speech. And according to this uh, article that's in the Christian Post, which is an evangelical publication, defeating Hamas will make prophecy of Isaiah a reality. And you've got all these others, just hundreds and hundreds and thousands of websites and articles and news stories and particularly YouTube videos where people are giving their interpretations of what's going on now in the war that we're living through. I'm making this in October of 2023. Okay, let's just take a look at this article. I'll call it up from the Christian Post. And I think this was just uh, probably a couple days ago. So, uh, this is actually reporting on a speech that uh, the prime minister gave. I heard the speech live, and it basically was a speech, a very strong speech, affirming Israel's intentions to utterly destroy Hamas. But at the end of the speech, and I'll go to the end of the article where it's quoted, you'll see something very interesting. Uh, this is a quote from prime minister. We shall realize the prophecy of Isaiah, and here it is, there will no longer be stealing at your borders, and your gates will be of glory. Together we will fight, together we will win. Okay, so this is pulled out, as the article goes on to say, from Isaiah 60, verse 18, which reads in English, in most English translations, violence shall no more be heard in your land, devastation or destruction within your borders. You shall call your walls salvation and your gates paradise. So possibly this is a rough 
allusion to or reference to Isaiah 60, verse 18. Now, that's not the Isaiah apocalypse. That is a line in a prophecy in Isaiah talking about the ideal future when essentially the kingdom of God comes to the earth and uh, all the nations learn the ways of God and so forth. Now, here's what I want you to notice. The quote that the prime minister uses is the kind of thematic quote that people often take from the Psalms or the prophets or really anywhere in the Hebrew Bible and Christians in the New Testament that really has to do more with certain themes, a theme of peace, a theme of glory, a theme of no more devastation and destruction. And so for him to quote and apply it, it's like saying, and in the future, it will be like the prophet Isaiah said. And it's not as though the prime minister is taking the chapter of Isaiah 60 and going through it and trying to claim that every line of that prophecy is predicting the war with Hamas that's going on right now. So you see the difference. But notice what happens in this article that is so blatantly Christian. In that same chapter, just two verses prior to the one quoted by Netanyahu is what most scholars believe is an Old Testament reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I just find that unbelievable. Uh, absolutely, most scholars don't believe that. I don't think any scholar that's a real scholar believes that because it's completely ahistorical. And notice what they think is quoted. Verse 16, you shall suck the milk of nations, you shall nurse at the breast of kings, and you shall know that I, the Lord, am your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Now, this particular author, and it's very common in Christian circles, thinks that this is a reference to Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, which is utterly ridiculous. Constantly in the book of Isaiah, you have the Lord God, and this is actually the divine name, yod Hey vav Hey, Jehovah or Yahweh, and his Messiah or his anointed one. And even Paul makes that clear in his letters. He says, for us, there is one God, okay? That's the God of the Shema. Hero is, well, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and it gives his name, and one Lord Messiah, Jesus the Messiah. Jesus himself in the Gospel of John refers to the same idea, chapter 17, when he's praying and he says to God that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus the Messiah whom you have sent. Well, I've talked about that a lot in other videos, but and that's not the subject of this one. But I just thought it was amazing that when the prime minister wants to make use of the poetic allusions and imagery of the book of Isaiah without going through verse by verse and claiming it's a fulfillment, this particular Christian article in the Christian Post says, you know, isn't it amazing if the prime minister had just read another verse or two, he would realize that Jesus Christ was the Lord the God of Israel, the Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Well, the Redeemer, the Goel, is very, very clear in the book of Isaiah, chapters 40 through 66, and there's no question about it. I am Jehovah, I am Yahweh, there is none beside me, and so forth. So I just thought I would point that out. But my point in going to the Google search in the first place was just to say that there's a lot of talk about Bible prophecy being fulfilled. So let me share my screen again, and now we will go to the one that I want to talk about using the Accordance Bible program, which is what I use. I've got the English up here. This is actually the Revised Standard Version. Now, what we have in the book of Isaiah, when you get to chapter 24, is you have four chapters, 24, 25, 26, and 27, which scholars call the Isaiah Apocalypse. And it's very, very different from chapters 1 through 23 of Isaiah, and also 
chapter 28 on through chapter 39 of Isaiah. And so uh, it just literally sticks out or stands out as a set piece. Four chapters that are very apocalyptic, which is really uncharacteristic of Isaiah. They have very few references to a time or a chronology or any king or any specific invasion other than the enemies of Israel. But it's not just the enemies of Israel. This particular cycle of chapters, the Isaiah apocalypse, stands out because it's very universal. Notice, behold the Lord, and that's L-O-R-D, Jehovah or Yahweh, the Lord will lay waste the earth and make it desolate. Now, you can translate aretz in Hebrew as the land and make it confined to the Holy Land. But as you go on reading, you see that it's much more cosmic than that. It is really talking about the devastation of what we would call today planet Earth. Now, let me just read the first three verses and you'll get the idea. Behold, Yahweh or Jehovah will lay waste the earth and make it desolate. He will twist its surface and scatter its inhabitants. And it shall be as with the people, so with the priests, as with the slave, so with his master, as with the maid, so with her mistress, as with the buyer, so with the seller, as with the lender, so with the borrower, as with the creditor, so with the debtor. The earth shall be utterly laid waste and utterly despoiled, for the Lord has spoken his word. Wow, what a blast, right? Now, just as a side note, almost like a little footnote, uh, I picked up my Bible here. I'm going to read a section from the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 7, where I think he has this prophecy in mind, this exact prophecy, and particularly these verses. doesn't quote them, but he alludes to them in a very strong way. He's talking about whether you should get married or not. And he says, in view of the present distress that he thinks is coming upon the world, and he writes this in the 50 CE, if you're married, you can stay married. If you're not married, maybe you shouldn't get married. And why is that? Because the appointed time has grown very short. And then he says this, let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with the world, for the form of this world is passing away. The schema in Greek, the structure of the world is falling apart. I think he has this in mind. And in the book of Revelation, this section of Isaiah 24 through 27 is alluded to many, many times. I pointed out in the last video that I would encourage any of you that really want to study the Bible in depth to get this particular study Bible. This is the Harper Collins Study Bible. And the reason I recommend this one in particular is it's put together by the Society of Biblical Literature. That's the most reputable and reliable gathering of biblical scholars in the world. And they published this, and it's a study Bible with notes, so that you have the text, but on every page you have all kinds of notes. And I looked at the notes on this section that I'm covering today, Isaiah 24 through 27, and they are absolutely excellent. And what they say is very much along the lines of what I'm saying, is that these four chapters seem to be kind of floating. They don't really refer necessarily to the time of Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah doesn't say in these chapters, I receive this word from the Lord or anything like that. It just begins like this. Behold, the Lord will lay waste the earth and make it desolate. And as you read it, you begin to see it's more and more cosmic, and it goes way beyond Isaiah's time. And frankly, we don't think that Isaiah wrote it, but it's embedded now in the book of Isaiah. And frankly, scholars don't think Isaiah wrote this. It's not his style. It's not his vocabulary. It doesn't claim to be by Isaiah. 
I mentioned also previously that Isaiah, according to most scholars, has at least three major parts, chapters 1 through 39, that we think do go back to the time of the 8th century BC prophet Isaiah. But then when you get to chapter 40 on through chapter 55, there's another section that doesn't seem to come from the time of Isaiah. And then chapters 56 through 66 seem to be a third section. So scholars often refer to those latter sections as 2nd Isaiah and 3rd Isaiah. This, though, is embedded within, I guess you could say, 1st Isaiah, these chapters. So they really stick out, as I said, and they really need to be looked at. So let's take a deeper look. The earth mourns and withers, the world languishes and withers, the heavens languish together with the earth. The earth lies polluted under its inhabitants, for they've transgressed the laws, violated the statutes, broken the everlasting covenant. And if this is a universal covenant, it would be the covenant of Noah that's in Genesis chapter 9. And it essentially has to do with violence filling the earth and not shedding the blood of fellow human beings. A curse devours the earth. Its inhabitants suffer for their guilt. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are scorched, and few men are left. And then it begins to talk about the wine is all dried up. There's no singing. There's no rejoicing. Nobody's playing their music at the clubs, you might say. The noise of the jubilant has ceased. Nobody's playing the lyre, which would be your guitar, I guess. Nobody's drinking wine and singing. Strong drink is bitter to those that drink it. The city of chaos is broken down. Every house is shut up so that none can enter. There's outcry in the streets for lack of wine. Isn't that interesting? This emphasis on wine, which makes life bearable, perhaps, and giving you a bit of joy. The gladness of the earth is banished. Desolation is left in the city. The gates are battered into ruins. For thus it will be in the midst of the earth among the nations, as when an olive tree is beaten and as the gleaning when the vintage is done. So the world and the cities of the world, because this becomes very generic as you read it, it's not talking about the destruction of Jerusalem necessarily, as you'll see. So the world itself and all the nations of the world have been stripped of everything. Then, notice this. In verse 14, you seem to get a change. Somebody's happy over this. How would you be happy over such devastation? They lift up their voices. They sing for joy over the majesty of the Lord. They shout from the west. Therefore, in the east, give glory to the Lord. In the coastlands of the sea. So you see how this has to do with something much wider than just anything that happened in the time of Isaiah with the Assyrians threatening the land. So uh, they give glory to the Lord, to the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. From the ends of the earth, we hear songs of praise, of glory to the righteous one. And by the way, even though some people might read the righteous one as Jesus it absolutely, in this context, refers to the one Lord God of Israel. But I say, I pine away, I pine away, woe is me, for the treacherous deal treacherously, and the treacherous deal very treacherously. So there's a first person here. Notice, I say, we don't know who that is. You could say, well, it's Isaiah, Dr. Tabor, why don't you see it? Let's keep reading. Terra and pit and snare upon you, O inhabitant of the earth. Okay, very broad again. He who flees at the sound of the terror will fall in the pit. And if you climb out of the pit, you're going to get caught in a snare. The windows of heaven are open. The foundations of earth tremble. The earth is utterly broken down. It is rent asunder. The earth is violently shaken. The earth staggers like a drunken man. It sways like a hut. Its transgression lies heavy upon it, and it falls and will not rise again. So talk about what's called in the prophets the day of the Lord. 
This is the day, capital D, of all days, because it's a judgment upon the whole world. Now, obviously, and if you go through again the Harper Study Bible, they take this verse by verse and show you where else this material that's in these four chapters is picked up and appropriated and reapplied down through the ages, including in the New Testament. I mean, this sounds like Book of Revelation stuff. And according to Mark 13, the Jesus apocalypse, Jesus also has been reading texts like this, and particularly this text, because he talks about earthquakes and people's hearts failing them for what is coming upon the world and so forth. Now look at this. Then it gets very cosmic. On that day, the Lord, Jehovah or Yahweh, will punish the host of heaven in heaven and the kings of the earth on the earth. So you can see this is very widespread. It's not just talking about ancient Israel. They will be gathered together as prisoners in a pit, and they will be shut up in a prison, and after many days will be punished. And the moon will be confounded, and the sun ashamed. For the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, and before his elders he will manifest his glory. So Jerusalem here is lifted up, as happens in a lot of the prophecies. And then you get this praise. Now we're in chapter 25. There's the chapter mark. Chapters don't really matter. It's all one piece. O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name for you've done wonderful things. Plans of old, faithful and true. You've made the city a heap, the fortified city a ruin. The palace of aliens is a city no more. So this destruction of the cities refers to the cities of the Gentiles. And Jerusalem itself and Mount Zion are protected and begin to rise up. Therefore, strong peoples will glorify you. Cities of ruthless nations will fear you. Basically, the whole world is shaken down to the foundations. For you've been a stronghold to the poor and a stronghold to the needy in his distress. A shelter from the storm. It sounds like Bob Dylan might have pulled his uh, line of his song, Shelter from the Storm, from this chapter. And a shade from the heat. For the blast of the ruthlessness is like a storm against a wall, like heat in a dry place. And you subdue the noise of aliens as heat by the shade of a cloud. So the song of the ruthless is stilled. Then you get a feast. Uh, this is later called the Messianic Banquet. You find this in the Dead Sea Scrolls. You find this in the New Testament. There's going to be this great feast. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples. Notice it's not just some sort of triumph of the Jewish people or the Israelites. to feast for all peoples. So after this destruction comes a celebration or a banquet for all those who are righteous and poor and needy and did not follow these ways of evil. A feast of wine on the lees, fat things full of marrow, wine on the lees, and well-refined. So this is like good wine. And he will destroy on this mountain the covering that is cast upon all people, the veil that is spread over all nations. And that's usually understood by the commentaries as a veil of mourning, where you cover your head with mourning. You don't even want to look out. And the veil is going to be removed. And it goes on to say, he will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. So you can see how universal this is. And it will be said on that day, lo, this is our God. We've waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We've waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. For the hand of the Lord will rest on this mountain. And then it mentions Moab. Well, Moab is essentially across the Jordan. It's in the country of Jordan today. Moab will be trodden down as straw is trodden. And then the Lord is going to spread his hands like a swimmer. And then we get to chapter 26. In that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. 
We have a strong city. He sets up salvation as walls and bulwarks. Open the gates that the righteous nation, which keeps faith, may enter in. You do keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, because he trusts in you. And notice this very famous verse, trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord God, it's actually Jehovah Yah, is an everlasting rock. Uh, Rock of Ages, this Christian song, Rock of Ages, actually is built from that phrase. For he has brought low the inhabitants of the height, the lofty city. He lays it low, lays it low to the ground, casts it to the dust. The foot tramples at the feet of the poor, the steps of the needy. So this is the utter overturning of the ways of the world, of the ways of warfare and death and suffering and evil. And the way of the righteous is level, and you do make smooth the path of the righteous. Quoted again, Dead Sea Scrolls, New Testament. Jesus talks about what is up will be down, what is down will be up. The Apostle Paul talks about that as well. So the material and the thoughts and the ideas in this floating section of Isaiah become extremely influential in shaping the basic contours of what you could call the apocalyptic hope and the apocalyptic pronouncement of judgment upon the world. So it begins to sound very universal. So the way of the righteous is level. So here you have righteous people saying, in the path of your judgments, O Lord, we wait for you. Your memorial name is the desire of our soul. My soul yearns for you in the night. My spirit within me earnestly seeks you. For when your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world learn righteousness. Well, if you think of even the basic commandments of don't lie and don't steal and don't kill and respect family and parents and so forth, you can see the moral kind of imperative that the writer is putting forth. If favor is shown to the wicked, he does not learn righteousness. In the land of uprightness, he deals perversely and does not see the majesty of the Lord. And others, people who are poor or needy or people who even take a peaceful approach to others can just be crushed. Uh, it's not going to stop the wicked from deciding to crush them. O oh Lord, your hand is lifted up, but they see it not. Let them see the zeal for your people and be ashamed. Let the fire for your adversaries consume them, and so forth. Now, as it goes on, you get a shift here that's very interesting. It's, this is a prayer, so let me just start with verse 13. O Lord our God, other lords besides you have ruled over us, but in your name alone we acknowledge. Well, this is the cry of the people of Israel, and you think about it, Assyria almost threatened Judea in the south and uh, was uh, pushed away at the very end by a plague that came, according to Herodotus, according to the Hebrew Bible. Uh, the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem, and later the Greeks came in, and the Romans came in, and so forth and so forth. But notice this. Other lords have ruled over us. They are dead. They will not live. They are shades. This is the Hebrew view of death. That when you die, you go into Sheol and you become a shadow of your former self. You don't have a body. Your body goes back to the dust. You could say your soul rests, but basically you become a shade. But what this affirms is not resurrection of the just and the unjust, but essentially all of those wicked nations and wicked people of the past just get left in the grave. They never come back. They will not arise to that end, you visited them with destruction and wiped out all remembrance of them. But you've increased the nation. You've increased the nation. You've been glorified. You've enlarged the borders of the land. Now notice this. O oh Lord, in distress we sought you. They poured out a prayer when your chastening was upon them. Now you could think of all kinds of things in Jewish history in particular. Think about the Holocaust. Like a woman with child who rises and cries out in her pangs when she is near her time. We were with child. We ride. These are labor pangs. 
we have, as it were, brought forth a wind. Imagine a woman going through childbirth, and finally at the end, after all of the struggle for hours and hours, the doctor says, there's no baby. It was for nothing. There's nothing inside your womb except for air. We have brought no deliverance in the earth, and the inhabitants of the world have not fallen. But then you get this very famous verse right here. I'll highlight it. Your dead shall live. Their bodies shall rise. And actually, the Hebrew is even more literal. It's like my dead body shall rise that I certainly don't think, you know, it's talking about God. But maybe the bodies, it's, the translator here is understanding it is that the wicked will never rise, as it says. But those who struggled and writhed in labor pangs and brought forth nothing will be brought forth from the dead. O dwellers in the dust, awake and sing for joy, for your dew is a dew of light. So God sends dew down upon the earth, and it penetrates the world of the dead like a, a bright light shining into Sheol, and over the land of the shades, you will let it fall. So this, along with Daniel 12, is the only reference we have in the Hebrew Bible, clear reference to the idea of the resurrection of the dead, in this case, the righteous dead, the dead that are going to be redeemed and raised up. Other parts of Isaiah don't say anything about this in terms of that first section, Isaiah 1 through 39. And I don't even think it's mentioned in the latter chapters either. Now notice this, we're in 26. Come, my people, enter your chambers. Shut your doors behind you. Hide yourselves for a little while until the wrath is past. For behold, the Lord is coming forth out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. And the earth will disclose the blood shed upon her and will no more cover her slain. So the idea would be that there's going to be an accounting, there's going to be justice, and all of the evil is somehow going to be addressed. And yet there's a time of wrath. So you can see why this is applied and reapplied all down through history to the great and terrible, awesome day of the Lord, as it's called. In that day, the Lord with his hard and great and strong sword will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent. Now, what is this about? Well, you can study Leviathan, the dragon in the sea. There's already developing apocalyptically this idea of the great dragon, the evil forces of chaos uh, that in creation are pushed back and pushed away to make room for human beings. And now like the waters coming in of the flood or something, they're personified as this Leviathan monster. And then, this is chapter 27, you're going to get a pleasant vineyard. Uh, it's going to get watered. It's going to get guarded by God. Uh, there won't be any more wrath. Thorns and briars will be gone. They'll all be burnt away, and there'll be peace. Jacob will take root. Israel shall blossom and put forth roots and fill the world with fruit. So that would be the promise to Abraham that through your descendants, all the nations of the world will be blessed. Uh, it goes on to say, has he smitten them as he smote those who smote them? Have they been slain as their slayers were slain? Measure by measure, in other words, things will be finally made just. And I'm not going to read all of that, but I'm going to read the last verse. In that day, so the day, basically, of 24, 25, 26, and 27, you can see how short these chapters are. And in that day, from the river Euphrates, that's all the way into Iraq, and the brook of Egypt, all the way down to the border in the Sinai that Israel has with Egypt, the Lord will thresh out the grain, and you will be gathered one by one, O people of Israel. That's the only real clear historical reference that we have to maybe place or geography. Moab was mentioned earlier, if you recall, but that's only one little tiny part east of the Jordan. 
doesn't seem to be cosmic or the whole world. But here you have a very geographic reference. And in that day, a great trumpet will be blown. And those who are lost in the land of Assyria, well, that would be the northern exile, right, that took place in Isaiah's time. And he prophesied that and talked about it, the Assyrian invasion of the north and the carrying away of those northern Israelite tribes, sometimes called the lost or the scattered tribes. And also those driven out to the land of Egypt will come and worship the Lord on the holy mountain at Jerusalem. So those are the three chapters, the Isaiah apocalypse. And I think you can see that these chapters are even more generic and more universal than Joel chapter 3 that we covered that's more about the siege of Jerusalem, or Zechariah 14 that we looked at in the previous episode, which actually talks about a siege of Jerusalem where half the city goes into exile and the women are raped and people are carried away and so forth, and then God suddenly intervenes. This clearly is much broader and more universal in its references and you can see why these texts, with all of their allusions and their poetic references and the kind of language that is used, so you can see how these chapters, being much more universal and much more generic in terms of a judgment upon the whole world, would lend themselves to all kinds of apocalyptic literature that comes subsequently to the time of Isaiah or whenever this was written. These four chapters, more than any others I can think of, begin to present this universal, worldwide vision of the final day of judgment. And you can see why they get referred to constantly in other parts of the Bible and throughout history. So this is the floating prophecy par excellence. Take care, everyone, and I'll see you next time. And I'm going to continue with some of these other floating prophecies that you're going to hear people refer to today. I hope you're learning a lot. I hope you'll dig into these texts. I like to teach this series kind of line by line, verse by verse, text by text. I know there's a lot to take in, but I'm doing it for people who really want to study the text, not just watch somebody on YouTube throw out a few ideas. And that's why I put up the text in front of you. I know many of you appreciate that. So read Isaiah 24, 25, 26, 27, if you haven't, and get a good study Bible. You'd think I have some marketing deal with this book, but I don't. But Harper Collins Study Bible, it really is one of the best. See you next time.